Everybody, welcome back to Las Vegas. This is Dave Vellante with John Furrier, who's in the house. Where this is our coverage of reInvent 2024. We're up on the third floor of the Venetian. Super excited to be here. Betty Junod, friend of the Cube, CMO and Hello. SVP at Heroku. Hello. Salesforce, great to see you. Great to see you. Looking awesome as Thank usual. You. What a week. I see you guys everywhere. Yes. Like purple you, everywhere. Like, supercharged Heroku. Um, how's it going? Uh, it's been a big week for us. Um, you know, I've been at Heroku for a few months now, yeah. and it is. Um, we have, this is our big launch week. So, new version of the platform, next generation. Um, we're bringing in a whole bunch of great AWS services, and putting the amazing um, and beautiful like developer experience that people have come to expect from Heroku. Can we kind of go for the audience, just help yeah. people understand sort of the the genesis of the the Heroku Salesforce? I mean, when, I remember when the acquisition was like, this is brilliant. Because now we're going to be building apps, mm -hmm. more apps on top of this, you know, platform, which you know is taking the world by storm. So we went from sort of product to platform, mm -hmm. and Heroku was a key part of that. And then it's evolved, and now you got this Gen AI wave, and you're putting this company into a new trajectory. Explain that. Yeah. So uh, for a little bit of context, you know, Salesforce was one of the first, you know, big successful SaaS um, platforms out there, and then Heroku started in about 2007. Uh, early days of AWS, um, and we were um, a company that was really about like helping people get build their own apps for the cloud because no one knew how to do it. EC2 was new, so um, we've been with AWS since the beginning of the journey, building all the experiences around it so that it's easy for developers to build, deploy, and scale their apps without having to like muck around with all the stuff in cloud infrastructure. So we're taking care of like some of the reliability, scaling all of those things for you. And then about 2011, I believe, um, Salesforce acquired um, Heroku. And we've been part of the family for a long time. And so we've always still been serving the individual developer that wants to just get going quickly. The interesting that's happened over that time is, um, you know, Salesforce has uh, many different clouds, marketing clouds, sales cloud, CPQ, all of those things. There's a lot that we bring to the table for the um, business user, low code and no code. I'm going to build custom workflows. Workflows that help automate my business, right? Get work done. The addition of Heroku allows for like, hey, I want to do more custom things. I want to do parallelized compute processes. I want some specialized developers to do complex calculations on my price books. I have complicated price books. And bring that into my CRM workflow. Heroku becomes a great place to do that. And then we seamlessly integrate it into the Salesforce experience for the business um, analyst. And then the last part is just the pure PaaS play. You know, like CIO, CTO, standardizing on their platforms internally to enable all their lines of businesses to build custom products that they deliver to customers. So, it, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, Salesforce really was the OG of, of SaaS yes. cloud. I mean, it predated, and I was listening to Frank Sloopman the other day on a, I don't know if you saw that, he was on some podcast, and he was talking about when he went to ServiceNow, and they had, they were building the cloud, and they, they were like, well, Salesforce did it. Yeah. You know, this is their sort of the gold standard. And then, of course, as you know, they sort of had to build their own cloud. And it yeah. was sort of a mess at first. But, of course, they took a, a page out of uh, Salesforce and really improved it and obviously a great company today. Um, but that example that you gave about the price books, how is that changing? Because is it largely unautomated? Is it quasi-digitized? And how is it changing today? Take us through that, if you were. Um, do you mean like the customer example on yes. doing those things? Yes. Well. What this has happens is um, um, it's one of our customers and they're using, you know, they're using Salesforce or their CRM um, and they're, they're using CPQ. And it is really like, you know, based on how they're kind of creating the um, creating the opportunity and wanting to quote a scenario for their customers on their, you know, uh, workforce tool. So I'm just going to kind of try to guess who the customer might be. Um, but as calculations get more complicated, what this allows is the salesperson can still go through the process of building that quote and doing whatever, but then all that computation for like the number of seats, the configurations, the functionality they want, that is all being run in an engine on an app that's on Heroku. And then it spits back like the, this is what you give to the customer. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of that used to be sort of either quasi-automated or mm -hmm. run-automated and now, and this is where it's so exciting. And of course, Mark's out talking about age, agents agent and force. Agentic and yeah. Agent Force. And when you think about it, I was just talking to George about this. Eric Brynjolfsson put out this power law of automation. Mm -hmm. And he basically said, look, with SaaS and, and even commercial uh, off-the-shelf software, we've only hit a slice yes. of the market. And there's all this other unautomated stuff that humans are doing. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that we're going to attack. Yep. And that's really kind of Mark's vision, I think. Yep. That's where the 10x comes in. So agent force is like the big force behind the company, right? Yes. Now. And I think the, the agentic layer and what that, and with natural language processing and the natural language interactions and the ability for these models to keep learning really brings an interesting lens to it. Because uh, the thing you talk about, automation has only been, you know, we've only addressed a little bit, like RPA, right? It's yeah. so rigid. It has to be well understood, like I have all five steps identified. What we can do now with things like Asian forces put together like, hey, here's the steps that it needs to complete based on the data that you have. The data that you're pulling from could be from CRM systems and with things like data cloud that we have. It can be any other existing enterprise system. And then the work we have with MuleSoft can then um, allow to like call into other third party systems. And then if as part of that, if there are very specific like actions we want the agent to take that are very custom, hyper personalized, hyper customized, those can be written by the AI developers and running on Heroku. And all of that comes together through an Agent Force UI, Agent Force um, experience for your business analyst. And the interesting thing about Salesforce is you, you've got the operational data, you've got the metadata, the technical metadata, the operational metadata. The customer data. It's, the, the, yeah, right, it's all yeah. there. Yeah. And so then you can harmonize that data and then serve it up to the agency. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you got to govern that. you got to have access controls. Mm -hmm. Explain the importance of of, of low code and, and how that affects the market, the TAM, if you will. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, uh, you know, as you know that I've been in this developer tool space for like at least a decade, mm. and we always look at the number of developers. So I'm gonna start here in that there's 28 million developers out there using all kinds of languages. When you look at the knowledge workers out there, we're talking about a billion people. They're not, they're not all developers. So how do you empower non-technical people to do the things that are like to build business process, automate those business processes. Um, I think this is where um, Salesforce, um, with the entire portfolio that we have, is is magic for um, for you know businesses because we have this great like uh, uh, no code or low code like GUI based workflow that anyone can use, and then so that um, you have a business analyst, operational person that's point click drag drop. I know that we in order to do this like, you know, this finance thing, invoice reconciliation. I know that we have to do these 15 things, check these fields and do that. Anyone can write that. And then I could say like, I really need to do something really like very, we need to do something, you know, pretty complicated or specialized here. I can go to very specialized technical people and they can build those things. I think we're have the opportunity to bring those 28 million and like these other billion together. So it's more than 10X. Uh, more than 10X. Opportunity. So, okay, so that, that, that low code is not necessarily an engineer. It's, it could be a business analyst. Maybe they know how to write a little Python code, do some SQL queries, uh, and then. But the no code is people like me. Yep. I can actually drag and drop. I've got a I've got a workflow, and my mm -hmm. I, I want to solve this problem. Just and 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 can I eventually? Am I going to be able to talk to the system and make that happen? Yes. Is that yes. So I mean. We've got a lot of these great like Asian Force hackathons and demos. And when you look at it, it is like you're going into like the Salesforce UI, right? You've seen it. You've seen what the CRM UI stuff yeah, looks we like. Yeah, use it every day. Yeah. And you go into this builder where you're like, I want to do this. I need, it, it's going to start by looking at maybe like this data source, right? Go look at this uh, data table, uh, do these three things. And it's almost like you're pulling from a menu, menu list, right? Like a drop down list of like these types of actions. And you pull those. Um, there's even places where you can like just type in like I want these things to happen and it'll draft up what that agent experience, what the agent logic is, and then you can edit from there. Um, so it's kind of like this grade of like uh, um, you know no low to you know we internally we call it pro code on that spectrum and like everybody has their part to play um, to making it making that magic happen. So given these new capabilities, what are you seeing in terms of some of the new and more interesting apps? that are emerging? Well, you know, really, I think um, fundamentally at all apps, um, the the interaction layer is changing with these agents, right? More than just a chatbot, it's like talking to another person in some ways. All of that is anchored on like being able to better use that data, right? Um, because there's so much data out there. Um, and I think when we think about agentic layers, it's not just that there are AI apps, but there is AI type of capability in every type of application. It's like you have static websites and dynamic websites. Now it's not just apps that are just 
serving you things, you're interacting with them in a wholly different way. So I think that's where it starts to get really interesting. Mm. So what's happening at, at reInvent this year? Reinvent. You guys got a lot going on. Uh, we got a lot. Um, specifically, I'll talk from a Heroku standpoint is like, this is our big launch. We re-platformed. Um, but the best thing is the user experience is exactly that simple, clean um, experience that people are used to. But they're getting... Um, they're getting things like Graviton uh, performance. They're getting EKS, um, ECR, Global Accelerator. They're getting managed inference powered by Bedrock, but in the same uh, simplified developer experience so that the developer is not dealing with, okay, how do I then go into the console and figure out which all tools that I'll use? Um, same experience they love with just more horsepower and more uh, more kind of tools around it. So the replatforming is to be able to take advantage of things like Graviton and Inferentia mm -hmm. and, yep. and and the lower cost and maybe you know eventually the new models of the model garden that's out there. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. what's entailed in a in a replatforming? That sounds sounds like a heavy lift. That's that's you're in the process of doing that. Oh, uh, we just launched that. the pilot um, this week, so um, it's a heavy lift for us. It's a zero lift for the customer right. experiencing. It's the same experience. What they will see is um, better performance, um, more flexibility. It. And us moving to this um, model with Kubernetes and also open telemetry opens up a new ecosystem. Uh, you know, we've been watching the projects for the last like decade and the projects are at an amazing point of maturity. The ecosystem, a lot of it is graduating, um, uh, becoming graduated projects. When we integrate and put those together um, and automate um, some of the things around it, the configuration, the setup, the uh, lifecycle management, we're really here to help customers be able to consume and benefit from these technologies. And that's lower cost per unit of output, which doesn't necessarily, which doesn't mean lower revenue because what's going to happen is you, you lower the cost, people will do more stuff, right? That's what always happens in our in our business, right? Well, I want to lower the barrier of effort before they can build uh, build the app that's going to serve their business. Right now, everyone's spending all this time building platforms. Why don't they just build their business, which is all digital products? You know, that's interesting because. Right, we had this platform mindset, mm -hmm. but not everybody's really good at building software and building platforms. People think it's easy to build software. It's actually not easy. Yeah. It's, it's really hard to build a platform and do platform engineering. That's what you do well. Mm -hmm. So basically we're entering an era where you're saying, here's the platform, go build on top of that. You know your business better than we know your business. Here are the tools to do that. Absolutely. And it's it's actually, it's it's impossible to predict exactly what's going to come out of that. You, you must be blown away by what you're seeing or hearing customers talk about. The response has been great. You know, we've been a little quiet for the last few, um, few years, quietly supporting customers and growing our business. Um, and this week we've been out in a very big way, a lot of purple everywhere. Um, and we've, the, the response has been very heartwarming. People, people who, who knew us then love seeing us back. We've been making um, new introductions to folks. Um, so it's been a really great week. What's the brand promise that the audience should be aware of? Ah, uh, Heroku. We want to help, um, the brand promise is to help customers, help organizations build, deploy, and scale their applications effortlessly. The whole idea is effortlessly. Do the you do the part that differentiates you, and we're here. The we're the empowerment engine to get you there. It's exciting times, Betty. I mean, we've we've seen a lot of these waves, and um, this one where you know we've been saying for a while we're in the early innings. You know, to use the baseball analogy, but. We're actually getting into the game now, mm -hmm. right? I mean, 2025, what are your, what's your outlook for 2025? If, if, if this was the year of kind of, this year and last year was kind of experimentation, eh, ROI, are we getting the ROI? What do you expect for 2025? I think 2025 is going to be more anchored around the um, ROI and business outcomes of, um, you know, having agentic layers and the realization that it's not something separate. It's not a, we're not looking for this killer AI app, but it's really about like that technology being part of everything part of a platform, part of your apps, part of your business. Um, and what does that mean for us? And the reason why we're excited about uh, Heroku and, and Salesforce, you know, generally is, you know, it's got to start with data. If you don't have a good data estate, you're, you're, you're kind of wasting money on GPUs and AI and so forth. But you actually have the data estate. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty well harmonized and, uh, and understood. And so we're not sitting around in a meeting arguing about where this data comes out came out of Salesforce. And yeah. so we know what that is. It's it's our Tableau dashboards. It's what the business is running on. It's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so that puts you in an interesting position to really start to take advantage of, mm -hmm. of this wave. You're on the S curve. It's yep. starting to get into the steep part. So yep. um, we're excited. We're excited too. Thanks so much for Thank coming you back to the Cube. Great to see you. Always a pleasure. Yeah.
All right, and thank you for watching. Keep it right there. John Furrier and Dave Vellante, we're in the house. We'll be back right after this short break. Reinvent 2024. You're watching The Cube.